Hello, this is a non enterogram negative rot presented by the essential DB reference, the pink code illustrated review of microbiology by Cynthia Corney Linson, Bruce Fisher, and Richard Harvey. <coughs> so, here you're going to see the non enterogram negative rot. So, you're going to start by having the classification where we had the free living bacteria. Then next, after the free-living bacteria, we have the gram-negative bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria consists of the cocci, the non-enteric growth, and the enteric growth that we have already seen in the previous tutorial. So if you have not done the tutorial yet, you have to pause the video and go back and see the videos now. These are the next are the non-enteric growth. So under the non-enteric growth, you have the different um, different species. The first one is the Bartonella, Bartonella species. The second one is the Bordetella parapetusis species. Yeah, um, the Bordetella parapetusis. We have the Bordetella petusis. We have basically Brucella species. The Francisella tularensis. The Haemophilus influenzae. Legionella nemophila. Pasturella mutocida. The Pseudomona aerovirus and the Hersinia pestis. So, you need to know that we have seen the other Hersinia under the ectheric rods, like the Hersinia enterocolitica and the Hersinia um, pseudotuberculosis. Basically, we have seen it under the enteric rods, but the Hersinia pestis is seen under the non enteric rods, <coughs> which are also other gram negative rods. So we start with the first one, which is hemophilus. So this is a diagram showing an electron microscopic view of the hemophilus in frenzy. And you see that the hemophilus in frenzy, the, uh, the variant factor of hemophilus in frenzy is that it contains the capsules at this level here. So it shows the thickness of the capsules. <coughs> Now, what are the infect infection caused by hemophilus influenzae? The first infection caused by hemophilus influenzae, we have contiguous, so we have otitis media, we have sinusitis, we have bronchopneumonia are being caused by hemophilus influenzae. All that disease, we have meningitis, epiglottitis, and septic arthritis, all of them are caused by hemophilus influenzae. Now, <clears throat> there are two main modes of transmission of the spread of hemophilus influenzae in the body. It can be either spread by the contiguous spread, that is, a usually local spread from one part of the body to another. Example: When they spread, when when they spread from the the, the from the, the the middle ear into the brain to cause meningitis, is going to be via contiguous spread. Or when they spread from the skin up to the joint, going to go to cause septic arthritis is still contiguous spread is it clear so often so the contiguous spread usually involve the unencapsulated strains of the hemophilus influenzae from the site of colonization in the respiratory tract now the disseminated spread now is via the blood vessels so when it's going to be spread all through the blood vessel example you um, you have a you have a you have a septic arthritis and then later on you have a meningitis. So you see that it is not a local transmission. It's going to be disseminated spread, is it clear? And this disseminated spread usually involves the capsular type, which is a type B strain, which is going to going to move via the bloodstream. And now this type B strain is usually the most virulent hemophilus influenzae. <clears throat> Now, what is the incidence of hemophilus in frenzy under the pediatric population? Now, you need to know that what before in the past, hemophilus in frenzy was very high, predominant in this different age group. Is it clear? So, this is was before the introduction of the vaccine. Is it clear? So, you see, these are the number of cases, the incidence that usually occur before the, the, the use the, before the use of vaccines. Now the vaccine program was not introduced. So this is the PRP vaccine introduced. The first vaccine introduced here. You see that there was a small decline and then the PRP conjugate vaccine now introduced. You have a drastic decline of hemophilus in frenzy. So this is now a summary of hemophilus in frenzy. Let's visualize the characteristic of hemophilus in frenzy. One is going to be pleomorphic in shape but it's best going to be a rod shape it's a pleomorphic rod ranging from small cocobacilli it can be 
Kokai to Basilai. So yeah, that's the specific characteristic of my friends and friends. That's why it's said to be pleomorphic, ranging from Coco Basilai to a long slender filament. So those are the pleomorphism, changing in shape characteristic of hemophilosin frenzy. It is an obligate parasite. It is not capable of living out of a host. It's an obligate parasite. It's going to require the hemine and the NAD plus for the growth. Basically. So it's going to cause, so you have culture on the extracolate agar is going to containing hemine and NAD. So these are, this is the cultural media for hemophilosin frenzy. It is chocolate agar containing hemine and the NAD plus nicotine adenine dinucleotide. <coughs> Now this is this is the, just the, the the pattern of growth on the chocolate agar. How the hemophilus influence is going to grow and the color of the the uh, the, the the colonies. And this is the gram stain. You need to know that hemophilus influence is not a gram is gram negative. That's why it is pinkish in color when it is stained by the sutranin stain, as you have seen in the introduction of microbiology. <clears throat> now this this is now. The next one is a gross specimen of species with bacterial meningitis. So this is bacterial meningitis. You can visualize um, showing the copious pollen exudate at the base of the brain. So this is a, a patient that has died because of meningitis and the, the pathology has shown that there is actually high pollen substances at the level of the meninges. Basically. So now, what are the diseases caused by hemophilus in frenzy? The first one is otitis media, the second is sinusitis, that is pneumonia, the fourth is bacterial meningitis, the fifth is epiglottitis, which is specifically most commonly caused by hemophilus in frenzy, this epiglottitis, and the next one is septic arthritis. So what are the first line drug that we use in case of hemophilus in frenzy? The first line drug is ampicillin clavulanic or amoxicillin clavulanic acid. Why? We use amoxicillin clavulanic acid because um, clavulanic acid is a beta lactamase inhibitor, and ampicillin is a penicillin, it's a broad spectrum penicillin. Is it clear? So, when you use ampicillin plus clavulanic, ampicillin is um, beta lactamase sensitive, so it's going to be broken down by the enzyme beta lactamase, which is being contained in the hemophilus in frenzy. Is it clear? So you have to use a beta lactamase inhibitor such that the ampicillin can work effectively. So you can use it in the first line. So if you don't want to use a beta uh, a beta lactam and a beta lactamase inhibitor, you can just use a beta a resistant beta lactam um, drug, which is more resistant to the beta lactamase. Is it clear? So example is this is the the the, the um, cephalosporins. Example you have the third generation cephalosporin in the case of cephotaxin and in the case of cefriazone. Now if you don't want to use beta lactams at all, you can down go to second generation <clears throat> to the second line of drugs which are being used in hemophilus species, which is trimetoprin and cefametoxazole. Is it clear? So those are the, the main drugs involved there. <clears throat> Now the next disease that we're going to speak about is going to be Baudetella pertussis. Now you need to know that the disorder by Baudetella pertussis is mostly due to the toxins caused by the Baudetella pertussis. Is it clear? So we have the pertussis toxins. Is it clear? Is one of so these are the different virulence factors of Baudetella pertussis. The first virulence factor is going to be the pertussis toxin. What does the pertussis toxin do? It causes lymphocytosis. is going to going to cause lymphocytosis. It's going to cause sensitization to histamine. It's going to cause activation of the insulin production, resulting to hypoglycemia. So those are the causes of the pertussis pertussis toxin. So the first one is lymphocytosis. Second is sensitization to histamine. The next is activation of insulin production resulting in hypoglycemia. <clears throat> now, the next toxin that is also produced by body therapeutics is the dermonecrotic toxin. Is it clear? So the next toxin produced by the Bordella um, pertussis is the dermonecrotic toxin. <clears throat> now, for the dermonecrotic toxin, so we have it's going to cause now vasoconstriction and ischemic necrosis. Is it clear? The dermonecrotic toxin that causes that. The next uh, virulence factor is the filamentous 
hema glutenin is going to facilitate the attachment of the bacteria to the ciliated epithelial cells the filamentous hemagglutinin as you can see here. the next is going to be trachea transcytotoxin which is going to inhibit the cilia movement of the trachea and prevent the regeneration and regeneration of damaged cells also prevent the regeneration of cell damaged cells that's the trachea cytotoxin virulence factor the next virulence factor is adenyl <clears throat> the next virulence factor is the adenyl um sorry for all this the next virulence factor is the adenyl um, cyclase toxin for the adenyl cyclase toxin is going to decrease the chemotaxis and the phagocytosic effect of the of the uh, of the the, the phagocytes basically and then the last one are the film brain is going to promote the attachment of the bacteria to the host cells so those are the different virulence factors for bordetella pertussis <clears throat> now we need to know that there are different phases when the DBD disorder with bordetella pertussis is clear. The first phase is the incubation period, which can take something like one week, the incubation period of bordetella pertussis. The next phase is going to be the cataral phase, and the cataral phase can take between one to three weeks. The cataral phase, and in the cataral phase, it is just a phase where you have a um, 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 <clears throat> echorizer form of a disease where you have runny nose, you have malaise, you may have tearing at the level of the eyes, you may have cough, so you may have um, a runny nose and all that malaise, and even some fever. That's the cataral phase of bolitera pertussis. The next phase of bolitera pertussis is the um, the paroxysmal phase, which it can be, which it stays from three to six weeks and is characterized by cough, severe cough, vomiting and leukocytosis is it clear? and the last phase is the convalescence phase of body pertussis and the convalescence phase is just like the recovery phase of body pertussis it occurs after six weeks so but paroxysmal phase from three to six weeks and after six weeks so that is from six to ten weeks is the convalescent phase and then at the end we have at the end theory year we have complete recovery of the patient so the recovery phase or the convalescent phase is when the child the patient is recovering from the disease <coughs> now this is the incidence of pertussis by age is it clear so you see that the incidence of pertussis in the past was very high is it clear so by it was very high by the age of less than one year but the therapist was a great threat by the age of less than one year in the past is it clear but now after the 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 the, the introduction of uh, of vaccine you see from 1 to 19 years is reducing and then greater than 20 years but the therapist infection also reduces is it clear <clears throat> now the summary on Bordetella is that the Bordetella species are small cocoa bacilli that grow singly or in pairs. So they are cocoa bacilli grow singly or in pairs, and we said that they are gram negative. That's why they are pinkish in color on gram state. They are encapsulated. They are aerobic. Usually, you have to know that um, generally uh, microorganisms that grow in the upper respiratory tract are more aerophilic. Is it clear? So they are aerobic. The culture, if you want to culture body therapy, you are going to culture on the Reagan Lowe agar. So, and this is the Reagan Lowe agar that show the peculiar growth pattern of body therapy and the color of body therapy. Is it clear? And this is a gram staining with the poppy with the um, with the pinkish color from the sustaining stain to show that it is gram negative. Is it clear? Now we have the bordetella pertussis. Now for bordetella pertussis is we have pertussis um, 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 is going to cause bordetella pertussis causes what is called whooping cough or pertussis. And the treatment of bordetella pertussis first line you use erythromycin and then the second line you use the trimetoprin sulfamethoxazole. Now we have ciliated cells of the respiratory system infected by bordetella pertussis colonized with this is shown with a scanning electron micrograph. Though we need to know that the scanning electron micrograph is not is not in color. So this color have just been created by the different animations. Okay. <clears throat> Now, the next thing to visualize now are the common pathogen causing community acquired pneumonia. 
So the first and the most common pathogen causing community acquired pneumonia is streptococcus pneumoniae. So if you have a patient having community acquired pneumonia, it is first streptococcus pneumoniae. But the first or the most common cause of respiratory tract infection are viruses. Is it clear? So usually it's mostly a cold, a common cold that is an upper respiratory tract infection is um, usually due to a virus and the virus that is mostly associated with the common cold are rhinoviruses. Is it clear? But for a case of pneumonia, the most common cause of pneumonia is caused first by Shepococcus pneumonia. After Shepococcus pneumonia, the second most common cause is by the viruses. So viruses are the second most common cause of the pneumonia. The third most common cause of pneumonia is Haemophilus influenzae. Then the fourth most common cause of pneumonia is Staphylococcus aureus. So this, this ones, Staphylococcus pneumonia, Haemophilus influenzae, and Staphylococcus aureus, all of them cause typical pneumonia. Is it clear? So these are the three major causes of typical pneumonia. And then Legionella pneumophilia, Chlamydia pneumonia, Mycoplasma pneumonia, and all that, they cause atypical pneumonia. These are the common pathogens involved in community acquired pneumonia. <coughs> now, the next one you have Legionella species. <coughs> Now, the next one is the Legionella species. So, for Legionella species, you need to know the specific characteristics of Legionella. So, what are the specific characteristics? You have it's a slender rod in nature, cocoa bacillary in clinical material. The second is that it is facultative intracellular parasite Legionella. It is intracellular parasite facultatively. So, it is more of free living than intracellular parasite, but you need to know that it lives intracellularly, just like mycoplasma. Is it clear? Now, the next one is organisms are unencapsulated monotricious flagella. So, that, that is, so it means that they are multi. So they have on they are unencapsulated and they have monotricious uh, flagella. The culture on specialized media and that specialized media is going to be charcoal his extract agar. So this is a charcoal his extract agar for the growth of the Gunella species and this is the growth how the Gunella species is going to grow. So you see that it's going to show pinkish color on a gram stain. So we just tell you that um, it's a gram negative rod. Is it clear for the granular pneumophilia, which is seen on a red um, stain rod in the cytoplasm of macrophages? Is it clear? The gymnasium stain. So, if you can use this, uh, this second diagram, to just show is a gymnasium stain, and the gymnasium stain is just to, um, to tell you, gymnasium stain is just to show how you can have also legionella pneumophilia inside macrophages because you said that they are also facultative facultative intracellular parasite that people are living inside macrophages. Now, <coughs> what does Legionella pneumophila cause? It causes the Legionella disease and also causes Pontiac fever. So those are the two main diseases. And the first line micro, the first line antibiotic that we use is azithromycin. They, they still under the first line. You can also use, use a levofloxacin. So those are the drugs involved there. <coughs> Now, the next one <coughs> is Pseudomonas infection. For the Pseudomonas infection, this is um, a pattern of Pseudomonas infection of the external ear, that's otitis external. So this is a 16-year-old wrestler presented with an, uh, with an auricular hematoma. Is it clear? So that's only that's the only thing that the patient had. Then later on, one day later after the surgery to repair the cartilage, there was infection with pseudomonas rubinosa which developed. Is it clear? And this is the appearance of the ear three months after the completion of the gentamicin therapy. Is it clear? And you need to know that there are also different anti um anti uh, um, antibiotics which are also going to be used. Is it clear? <clears throat> But you need to know that usually pseudomona is a very, very um, um, virulent disease, a very bad disease that we most of the most most of doctors are already are always feared of, is it clear? And the drugs to be used are high class drug, high order drugs in these cases, is it clear? And mostly they are hospital acquired after surgery. That's why this is a case of a patient that had the pseudomona aeruginosa infection after. A surgery from the hematoma of the ear. <clears throat> so this is the the pseudomonas species. So the characteristic is that pseudomonas species is encapsulated. It is a motile rod with a polar flagella. 
is it clear it is aerobic and sometimes it is also a facultative anaerobe it produces diffusible green and blue pigment so that's why every time you see um, you see a, an infection of an, an infection having exudate which is bluish or greenish you have to think of pseudomonas aeruginosa every time you see an infection with exudates let's say that the, 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 the sputum of a cough is greenish or bluish you think of pseudomonas aeruginosa infection or you can also see exudates from a, a unilateral swelling of a leg that is from a cellulitis you have to know that this one uh, one of the organisms involved in that cellulitis is going to be cellular so this is going to also be oxidase positive and as i've in, as i've initially said i've said that every time you see that any microorganism is aerobic is going to be oxidase positive so oxidase so oxidizes but does not ferment carbohydrate is it clear so that's why it's oxidase positive going to oxidize carbohydrate and do not ferment um, but do, do not oxidize but does not ferment carbohydrate such as lactose and you have the culture of pseudomonas is going to be on the maconky agar so when you use the maconky agar you are going to have this pattern of culture and on the gram stain of pseudomonas aeruginosa you are going to have a gram negative rod and that's why you have pinkish stain with sulfanin if it is gram positive then it's going to be purplish and not pinkish so you're going to be published or violet. Is it clear? So <clears throat> now the disorder caused by ceremonial aggregators are localized infection right, and even systemic infection. Now to treat ceremonial aggregators, you use um, a combination of of antibiotics as a first line. You can use anti pseudomonas beta lactam. Example of anti pseudomonas beta lactam is piperacillin tazobactam. Is it clear? So you see, we have piperacillin tazobactam, we have piperacillin, we have um, ticacillin. So those are examples of anti pseudomonas beta lactam. Now, tazobactam is a monobactam, an example of a monobactam which is used for specific microorganisms and in combination with others you can also use a third generation cephalosporin specifically ceftazidine ceftazidine is a third generation cephalosporin which has a high um, activity against the monas that's why it is used as second line, second line um, antibiotic in the case of neonatal um, neonatal sepsis now we have tab, tab, um, tabomycin. Tabomycin is also one of the class of the glycopeptides. It's also one of the class of glycopeptides, just like vancomycin. So you use all of this in combination to act to to to, to act against the pseudomonas species. Now we have you can also use a fluoroquinone that is in a first or you can use a fluoroquinone in a first line such as ciprofloxacin. Now the next. <coughs> Is a transmission of brucella. So, how is brucella being transmitted? So, brucella is transmitted from food. So, either from contact with um, with um, um, cattle, either with contact with cattle, such as the cow, the goat, pigs, either con contact with cattle, like rearing with it by rearing animals, or by contacting the um, products that are produced by cattle. So, just like unpasteurized milk. In case like cheese, in case like um, uh, milk and all that, you can contact brucella. And brucellosis is one of the disorders that is going to cause abortion in females. So it's one of the greatest infections that causes abortion in females. So if you have an infectious cause of abortion, the first thing you must think of is brucellosis. Is it like if you have a woman who have an infectious cause of abortion, the first thing you must think of is brucellosis. There are many other causes of abortion based on which trimester the abortion occurs. Usually in the first trimester, it's due to a chromosomal abnormality or any form of abnormality in the, the child. Is it clear? Now, in the second trimester, it is mostly due to the mother. Like in, um, in those cases, in the second trimester, the abortion is mostly due to the mother, like cervical incompetences or any disorder in the mother, like the anti phospholipid syndrome, like in the case of, uh, of, uh, of systemic leukocyte erythematosus, or calling the mother, and all the other different syndromes that are calling the mother. 
is it clear? and then the third trimester third trimester is abortion is not more is not really called abortion it is more premature delivery it is more of prematurity than abortion by at the level of the third trimester because you need to know that viability is going to occur by 20 weeks of gestation according to the the, the european and the american college of of and gynecology but here in our context cameroon our viability of a child that has from 28 week contestation so we can still consider um third trimester as but not really a third trimester part of third trimester as being abortion but more that is going to be of um, prematurity <coughs> So all that the patient now is going to contact, so brucellosis can now be transferred to one person. And you need to know that person-to-person -person transmission is usually rare with brucellosis. Is it clear? Now, what are the specific characteristics of brucella species? You need to know that it's a small cocoa bacilli arranged slightly in, so they are arranged um, singly or they can be in pairs. Second thing is that they are unencapsulated. The third thing is that they are aerobic. The fourth is that they are intracellular parasites and the fifth is that they are cultured on blood agar. So this is the cultural pattern of brucella on the blood agar and this is the gram staining of, of the brucella. So you see that it is pinky, you show that brucella is gram negative. And now the disorder caused by um, um, brucella is brucellosis on which is also called undulant fever to treat brucella you use first line you do a combination of tetracycline and a reform pin so those are the different things so now this is a, a an electron microscopic view of a microorganism called francisella tularensis this is going to this how it resembles so this is a term of a skin ulcer in case of a tulare a tularemia so when a patient has tularemia, that's a disease caused by francella tularensis, is going to have that. So these are the specific characteristics of a patient having francella, um, fran with francella species. So francella species is small, pleomorphic cocoa bacilli with a lipid-rich capsule. That's the first. Second is that it's going to also be an intracellular parasite francisella species the next is that it is primarily pathogen of animals the primary pathogen here is going to be animals and not humans in francisella species it is more affecting animals than humans and it is rarely cultured and if you want to culture it you can just you can culture it on a charcoal his agar as you have just seen above there you can culture it on a charcoal his agar and on charcoal his agar you're going to see a pattern of culture shown here so the gram stain of um, francisella is going to be you see it shows a pink, pinkish color we just tell you that the francisella species is gram negative now francisella tularensis causes the disease called tularemia so as first line antibiotic what do you use you use gentamicin or streptomycin which are amino glycosides so use uh, uh, um, amino glycosides and then or and then you add plus a tetracycline example do, um, doxycycline or in the second line you can use a ciprofloxacin that's a, a fluoroquinolone so tularemia now is a what is tularemia tularemia in a, a mush crack um, trapper so not the healing ulcer so in patient you see that the tularemia you have a disease where you have your coughing and then the patient also have ulcers physically that's that's a specific characteristic of tularemia now the next disease that we're going to see is plague is it clear <clears throat> so you need to know that plague is usually the reservoir of plagues are usually animal we have the fleas are the one that transmit it both to the animals and can also transmit it to man is it clear the central part here is flea the flea is the only one which is not affected it's just like a vector for mosquito so just it's like a vector in case of mosquito where the mosquito is transmitting plasmodium species to man to cause malaria so the flea in this case is like a vector of the the hersinia pestis causing plague so the flea it can transmit it to the squirrels and the squirrels are going to have the disease this one is going to be called so squirrels is going to be called sivatic plague 
it can transmit it to rats in the rat is going to call the urban plague and can also transmit it to man is it clear so when man get it from flea the man is going to get what is called the bubonic plague is it clear now now bubonic plague now can is a is when man is primarily affected with um with the plague so the first time that man is affected or when the man is affected from a flea directly now the second is that the bubonic plague can be transmitted if there is a secondary infection of man is going to result to bacteria in the lungs and that bacteria in the lungs can result to a pneumonic plague and the, the, the when the when the, the, the plague now infect the lung it can be transmitted through air so let's say this man here has bubonic plague bubonic plague is mostly on the skin is it clear the bubonic plate now can be transmitted the bacteria can grow in that same person to its lungs and the bacteria can also go go to the brain to cause plate meningitis so the lungs is going to cause what is called the the, the um, pneumonic plate now when the patient is going to cough out is now going to transmit now pneumonic plate now to other people is it clear but the flea itself which is up here transmit the bubonic plate so that's the life cycle. So in summary again, for the for Hersinia pestis, so the flea is the vector. It can transmit it to squirrels to produce silvatic plate, can transmit it to rats to produce urbanic plate, and the flea can transmit it to man. In man is going to trans is going to affect the skin called bubonic plate. Now at the six, so the Hersinia pestis can be transmitted from the skin of that man to the lungs of the man to produce the pneumonic plate and also transmitted to the brain of the man to produce the plague meningitis. Now in the in the case of pneumonic plate, the man that has pneumonic plate can, is capable of transmitting to other men uh, by by the, the air droplet infection by inhalation. So when he cough out sputum and other people inhale that sputum, he can transmit the pneumonic <clears throat> so this is the bubble characteristic of bubonic plague in Hersinia pestis. So now this is Hersinia species. The general characteristic of Hersinia species is that you have small rods um, that stain bipolarly. So these are rods, gram negative rods, is it clear, which which stain bipolarly, is it clear? So they are mostly like diplopoca. They are non motile they are encapsulated and they are cultured on blood. Or the CIN agar. So this is an example of the gram stain. And then you need to know that the disorder caused by plague can either be bubonic plague, which is which is also called septicemic plague, or it can also be pneumonic plague. And to treat Hersinia pestis, you just use a doxycycline in first line, or you can use an amylopyrifosite such as cepomycin or gentamicin in the first line. <clears throat> Now the antimicrobial agent that are useful against um, that are useful against Bartonella species. Bartonella is another one. We have azithromycin, which is a macrolide, or you can use as a first line, or you can use doxycycline plus if um, pain together. Is it clear? So now we need to know that Bartonella, the two main species of Bartonella, we have Bartonella quint quintana and we have the Bartonella hersele, is it clear? So those are the two main Bartonella species. So they are facultative intracellular powers and can be cultivated on special media on laboratory. So that's the only thing to visualize on Bartonella. <coughs> the next one is Pasteurella. So for Pasteurella, this is an example of a media of Pasteurella. This is Pasteurella multisoda, culture on blood agar. That's a pattern of growth on, of Pasteurella species. And this is the translucent, we are going to see translucent non hemolytic colonies. And this is a um, rich stain of Pasteurella. You see, so the rich Gemsa stain of the Pasteurella. You see, it is posh, published, is it clear? <coughs> So that is on going to be pasteurella. Now the antimicrobial um, therapy that you can use in case of pasteurella, you in first line you can use a penicillin G, you can use ampicillin, in second line you can use amoxicillin clavulanic acid, you can use or you can use doxycycline. So from here you have visualized all the disorder involved with the different the uh, non enteric rods. So you say thanks for your attention. Please don't forget to like and subscribe for our channel Science Maker.